And this is definitely something that has come about at Cognizant since we pivoted away from lead generation and we've actually had the space and time to think about um, how do we generate consistent content that's of a great quality that's going to feed our create demand efforts and ensure that we continue to build on all of that inbound demand that we need to create now that we're not doing that lead generation MQL piece. Um, so what does a media machine mean to us? I'm not sure it's actually ever really been totally defined in the context of B2B. So at Cognizant, and for me, what I mean when I talk about this is it means building your own audience with um, key subscriber channels. So for every company that may well look different, depending on who your persona is and who you're looking to speak to. Um, but that would be one of the key criteria. And it also means creating processes around content that actually are going to enable you to consistently produce that top quality content um, that's going to power many other areas of your marketing engine and all of that amazing create demand stuff that you end up doing when you're not doing lead gen. Um, and I think there are three key ingredients to a successful strategy when it comes to this. And for me, it's the quality of the content. So we actually have um, a quality lever at Cognizant in that whatever the content is, whether it be a post that I'm putting out on my LinkedIn, or it's something that's going out on the company LinkedIn page, it's a video. We basically don't want to put anything out in the world unless we feel confident that if someone reads or engages with that piece of content, they will have learned something new that could give them a competitive advantage in their role. Um, and for us, that's how we, that is kind of the guardrail that we have set for quality. Um, number two is that you need to have a point of view. So I think you'll see there are themes throughout, like a lot of the stuff that we talk about Cognizant, um, we're obviously big advocates on the sales side of outbound, but outbound done well. Um, and we still believe there's a place for cold calling. Um, and then on the marketing side, we talk a lot about this whole shift from lead generation to demand generation. So I think a point of view is also really important. And then ultimately to become known um, within your audience and within your space, consistency is obviously um like I think the third and probably the most crucial ingredient because you can create great quality content with a point of view but if you're not consistent I don't think you'll ever get um really the benefits of that media engine at scale so moving on as I mentioned earlier when you talk about the media engine and building this audience on key channels that matter to you you need to identify what those key channels are so um obviously for us at Congress and we have got a fairly large team at this stage so we are able to look at um, multiple channels rather than just um, one or two but I don't think your team size should prevent you from taking this approach I think you just need to be more focused in terms of where you focus your efforts so for us we look at YouTube our LinkedIn company page the LinkedIn um, subject matter expert profiles pages so for us we have Ryan Reset we have Dave Bentham on the sales side and then um, it's myself Fran and Liam on the marketing side and then our podcast um, and then our newsletters and then also our blog which is powered by our story hunters um, which I will touch on a bit more. Um, I'm just going to quickly check the chat because I think we might have some questions. Um, Liam are you bored? Sorry if I was looking bored, didn't mean that. Bored on this <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, Liam, let's bring you in. Anything to add on any of our key channels? Anything I've missed, actually, you know, anything that you would want to add to this? Of our media machine. Um... <laughs> no, not but... really, to be honest. <laughs> no, no, nothing. I'm trying to think now. You did a good job. <laughs> well, thank you, Sheila, because you've actually woken Liam up. He's back, he's focused in the room, and we can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> hot in the office maybe you were just flagging <laughs> yeah. are you in one of those booths because they are extremely hot yeah it's like an oven in here <laughs> um but please do keep questions coming in and we will make sure that speakers stay fully engaged throughout so how do you scale the media machine now this is i think like a really important question i'm not going to pretend that we've completely um got this built out and perfect yet because we don't and we're still definitely in the earlier stages of our journey with the media machine and um, all of the pieces and parts that go into that and the processes as well. Um, 
but just some I like just to show you like how we're reporting on this like how we're looking at it and the kind of content that we're producing and how what goes into it um this is like a just a broad overview on the video the newsletter and then some of our SME LinkedIn content so from a video perspective there's a number of ways in which we scale this out so we have um identified key themes within our target personas that are of interest so for example we know that things that resonate really really well on the sales side are cadence anything about a cadence so um prospecting cadences examples of prospect cadences and then specifically for job titles or for industries and then also we talk a lot about um scripts so cold calling scripts for um calling a cmo or a c-suite etc etc um and these are over and over again some of our best performing assets on video. So it's actually become a great mechanism for us in which to scale because we can create these broader themes. And then from there we can like deep dive topics specifically. Um, and we can get different um, experts to come on and talk through that as well. So you can see Josh Braun is one of our, um, one of, is featured here and he always does really, really well for us on video and on YouTube. Um, and then in terms of newsletters, like how are we scaling those? I think this is a really interesting one and actually something that I, we will keep, we'll keep looking at and deep diving because right now we currently have three newsletters running. We have a demand gen digest, which is focused on demand generation for demand gen marketers. We have a content digest and we have, um, a sales one. And so the content one is, gets written by our content writers. I mean, they are literally living, breathing um case studies of how to do amazing content so they basically scale that through using their own experiences and talking about that um, they're always text and long format only um, and then in and our demand generation digest will come from content from things like this any of our live events that i do or fran does or liam does the content that comes out of the videos that we produce um etc etc so that we can repurpose it and use it again and it enables us to scale it across multiple channels and then um scaling the linkedin profiles of our smes so this all comes down to planning like i think um you because consistency is so key here you won't you can't get away with kind of waking up on the day and deciding if you're going to post or not you need to have a well thought out plan um and even if it's not the content the exact content that you're going to post about it's committing to the days um and the number of posts that you're going to do and I hold my hand up to not being amazing at this. Liam is actually really good. So I might bring you in, Liam, to talk about how you keep your consistency up. So I think you've got, you're a good case study in consistency here. Yeah, I, 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 it's pretty simple, really. I just set myself, I just create like a, a document, um, which was actually your suggestion, Alice. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm great at telling people yeah. how to do it. Yeah. Uh, my execution is not so good. <laughs> I just create a document and then try and like, um, at the beginning of the week, plan out what uh, like three topics, um, two or three, depending on like time over the week, and then just uh, yeah, and early if it, it's in the morning, maybe like early morning thing is just to write something out um, or plan it, uh, and then take up any any opportunities to get recorded because <laughs> uh, videos just make it a lot easier to um, like do your posts with. I find so. Yeah, I think it's just like being a bit structured around it, give yourself like a time start and uh, yeah, a plan. Yeah, I would actually add, the thing that has helped me and I have been a little bit more consistent last few weeks was I did a block recording on a day. It was a Friday afternoon and I just like took a few topics and I that had either had a lot of comments or engagement within my older posts and recorded videos around those topics and now I have a bank that I can use and so when it comes to being like right I definitely need to post again um that makes it much more easy to do mm -hmm. I see a comment a question actually um so you only plan a week at a time yeah. um yeah I actually am doing it a week at a time at the moment um we got like a broad broad theme right that then I followed that I know that I'm going to the things I will talk about um and then, you know, one week I think, oh, I'll, talk, I'll post stuff about these things. And then the next week I'll like, I've planned, like, I'll, I'll be like, oh, that week I'll do, do it about that. And I actually, yeah, just do it. Um, I feel like you have to be able to have some like flexibility in to be able to respond um, to like also stuff that's going on on LinkedIn and stuff. And then you can try and be relevant as well. Um, whereas if you plan out for too long, um, yeah, some things might have changed. And then, yeah, you'll be maybe not keeping up with current trends 
And I think that kind of leads into Charlie's question. And I think it's quite interesting. And I'm going to be a bit brutally honest as well here as well. There are some people who I followed on LinkedIn because I thought their content was amazing and the quality of it was great. And I think that was at a time when they were doing it more ad hoc and more like off the cuff and as thoughts came to them and like probably less structured. Um, I think what they've now doubled down on is a theme and consistency and potentially at the expense of delivering like consistently valuable content that says something new and has a point of view. Um, I think there's a lot of repetition maybe in there now. So I think there's a really fine balance between, yes, it's true that just because you said something once, it doesn't mean you can't repeat it and say it again and not everyone will have seen it the first time. But I think you do need to ensure you are, um, as Liam said, like adjusting to what's being spoken about on LinkedIn and also what you got engagement with um, previously because it's often really clear what people want to hear more about like Brown your last post I think what came out of it was like we talked about these always on nurtures which we're going to talk about later yeah. and people were like that's really interesting and on-demand nurture how does that look like like how does it work um, etc yeah that definitely works I think that was something as well like when I was writing that post I included that in last minute because I was like oh we're doing these on-demand nurtures quite interesting but didn't really expect that to be like the main it wasn't the main focus but like all of the comments and any like direct messages that I got were all based on that so I think that's another thing as well like if you're too structured then you kind of like deviate from writing about what people potentially want to hear um but yeah we I I mean yeah I mean I'm not great at it either but um I usually have a a key theme and run with it for a while but um yeah quite sporadic I would say in terms of like the actual stuff that I'm posting I'd say what we we do I think what we have been good at and where what we've seen success with is where we've got an SME so like an official SME that is their role which is Ryan Reset um, and Dave Bentham they are completely structured because we have it being run by a member of our team who is responsible for that and they create they of create the structure for the posts they ensure they get the content ready and they ensure it goes out on time um, and with that, they have consistently been able to scale their following, um, like amazing engagement. And so it, we know it works. It's just we're probably where we're not being owned by a member of our team. It's kind of on us to do it ourselves. That's probably where the consistency point is falling down. But um, yeah, that's I guess hopefully we've answered your question there, Charlie. Um, I would say just don't I wouldn't over index on. Um, yeah the theme and consistency to the point where you stop adding value is my feeling I don't want to name names but certain people who I used to admire and love their content have definitely I think I would say have gone too far the other way um okay so oh did I actually let me just quickly check that I spoke to this I didn't speak to this so how do you scale the media machine so this is really important um and it can definitely scale up and down depending on the, your org size and how many people you've got within the team. Um, but for us, because we have a bigger team, I showed you the channels earlier, there's quite a few and each channel has an owner, um, including our subject matter experts, apart from Fran, Liam and myself, because we are marketers, we feel like we should be able to do it, own our own channel. Um, obviously we might need to relook at that a little bit, but um, yeah, each channel have, has an owner. And each channel has its own set of clear KPIs and goals. So I'm going to share with you, for example, what they're, what we set out when we um, brought on board Brian Reset. He's only works with us on a um, sort of like it, it's sort of a consultancy capacity. So it's not full time in any way. But I wanted to make sure that we had really clear KPIs and goals that we were working towards with him, which also then dictated consistency and structure of everything that we put into it, um, maximize the value that we got. So we wanted to scale LinkedIn followers to over 24K by the end of June, 2022, adding 1K a month. That was the target that we set out. We overachieved that every month, um, which was great. And then we wanted to contribute to an uplift in organic unique blog views by 25% every quarter. Now, the thinking behind this was that because Ryan was going to be our subject matter expert on all things sales content, that by writing better quality content, we were actually going to be generating um, more audience for that content. So that has actually borne out and we're over, we actually increased by like over 50%. So almost doubled against the target there, which has been amazing to see. Um, Ryan was to become the voice of our sales newsletter with subscribers increased 50% every quarter. 
again, this one, we overachieved significantly and um, it was kind of an input and an output KPI, which I think was also important because it meant that it held us accountable to getting that content out of Ryan. Um, he's become the host of our, our sales podcast side of the Revenue Champions. And I think one thing that he's been amazing at for us has been sourcing influential and interesting speakers. So we have weekly um, episodes with Brian and other sales leaders now. And uh, he was tasked with scaling active listeners to over 150 from the 35 that they were at the start of the year. Um, I think we're actually over a thousand now. So um, massive achievement on that one too. And just the consistency of episodes has really helped generate that. Um, and then producing regular video content to help drive our YouTube subscribers up to 10K in year one. Um, this one, I think we're, this is probably the one we're lagging the most uh, on. And again, I think that's probably because we've, we've indexed more on content and snippets for using on our paid social side of things and also organic social versus um, YouTube SEO and uh, the trending videos that we've actually discovered work best on YouTube. So I think that one's one we need to focus on more going into the next half year. And then running bi-weekly live events. Again, that was an input KPI, but that kept both Ryan and us true to a regular cadence of live events of which we were able to create loads of content, which we were able to use for the newsletter. We could actually then repurpose for episodes of Revenue Champions. We could use as video for YouTube. Um, we could actually turn into blogs, which drove the organic blog fees. Um, and also he could pick up the most bite-sized um, content for his LinkedIn as well. So that, um, yeah, this is some, some examples of some KPIs. Oh, we're having, we, we've got an ask, Liam, for you to do a dedicated session on email nurtures. You do love an email nurture. So. Yeah, yeah there we go. <laughs> I could also do, um, which might be better as well, just like a recorded video actually just running through the the first one that we get live so yeah yeah cool um there we go Ryan. it has liam has committed to that so keep him honest get him on linkedin and make sure he delivers um and then i wanted to touch on like org structure so i don't want you to freak out because i realize that when we do present these um we're very fortunate now that we've got a big team so there's a lot of um people there to help make this everything happened basically at Cognizant but I did think it was interesting to talk through how our structure has completely changed from the days when we were doing lead generation and a lot of that is does come down to just the change in focus um, and the emphasis we have on quality content now so one key thing is that we've separated our SEO writers from our what we call our journalists our story hunters because we feel like um on the SEO side, it's very different goals. We're trying to drive essentially capture demand. Um, there is a bit of create demand in there for some of the higher volume keywords that we go after, which are more volume play rather than intent play. But ultimately, most of the stuff that we're driving on the SEO side is actually like capture demand activity. Um, it's like very highly skilled and focused. And there are certain um, methods and ways in which you need to write, which don't necessarily go hand in hand with creating great create demand content. So we have separated them out so that that can sit very separately from what we call our story finders and our journalists who their whole purpose um, is to be writing the con types of content, the quality of content that's going to create demand for us at Cognizant within our personas. So um, they're looking for stories, things that are of interest um, in reddits and subreddits, then like LinkedIn, what's trending, what's not within our key personas. Um, and scaling that all out. And since we've been, we've done this, the blog traffic and engagement has like been staggering in terms of, I should have put the chart on here, but in terms of the growth and the projection on that. So it has massively been successful. Um, and it means that we're more successful on the SEO side and we're more successful on our audience creation side when it comes to that, that journalistic content. And then the other key thing that we've done um, is that we put content execs in the demand gen team as well so these we because we're very aware that content is not just blog writing especially in this world of like a media engine and if we're taking it really really seriously and we want to be where our audience are in all the places they want to be delivered content in all the ways they want the content to be delivered then that's multiple formats that's blogs it's text writing for SMEs 
on their LinkedIn organic pages, it's videos, it's snippets, it's uh, live events. And we want that all to be tied together with all of the activity that's going out for that persona within the, a demand, gener demand creation perspective. And so we feel like having these content people sitting within um, the demand generation teams that we're really going to be able to deliver that next level of content and that variety that we need to succeed and power the media engine further. So that's one big change that we've made. Um, and then how do we, so then I guess the question would be, okay, that's great. But then you've got like, you've got people responsible for content in SEO, you've got people responsible for content, which is like journalistic and you've got people responsible for content sitting in these demand gen pods, like how on earth are you making that all work together and there's no like repetition and double work so I thought I would just like really look at this from like a project process perspective and what we've built out so I think we've spoken to you a lot about these content buckets but essentially we think about our content in four buckets so we have thought leadership which is everything that's very high level this would be a great example of that something that we're talking about um, a broad theme that's not related to the product at all and then we have our content bucket which there could be a dotted line back to the product then we have our um, product bucket, which is all about the product the value, talking about pain points, et cetera. And then we have our social proof bucket, which is um, kind of as it says on the tin, it's every like sort of case study led, um, that type of content, which is really showing the value of Converse and through the eyes of you actual users. Um, and so we will have people working on content that sits in each of those four buckets for each persona across each of the three areas of content that I've already mapped out. And so the way that we're able to structure this and ensure that we don't have any double work and everything is super clear is we use Asana, but you could use Trello or another free, you could probably just use X, like Google Sheets if you wanted. Um, and we create, we make, we have like one board for each bucket. And then we break it out by personas and then there'll be projects within that. And we're very um, tight on like, if it's not in Asana, then you're not working on it and, or it never happened. So it's a bit like that sort of Salesforce rule that sales have. Um, but here's an example of a project under the sales persona where we've got these scripts, which I was talking about, which will go towards our video team's KPIs on video. So you've got Emily who runs video kind of working on these as well as Joe who runs the whole of the content team. Um, these will also get used in some of our SEO work because we know that like including videos and SEO content is really good for ranking, but also it's going to be really, really vital for all of the work that the demand, <laughs> sorry, all of the demand generation team are doing. Um, and all of that when they're looking at their always on buckets and that they're running on paid. Um, and so all of those people need to be involved in this essentially. And so that's how we run the project and we make sure that there's visibility on it. We have clear deadlines and everyone knows who's responsible for what. Um, Fran, I don't know if you want to touch on it a little bit more because you're actually um, running this right now with your org. Yeah, cool, um, can do. So yeah, I guess, um, yeah. So we have um, in the DG pod, we have like two content um execs like senior content executives who focus on we've got two core personas so like one on each persona i think the important thing here and um i've actually just ran a meeting like today with the team like in the office it's just like how um content are like thinking about that collaboration with demand gen traditionally like so i knew um one of the guys on my team like he would come up with a list of blog titles and that will be it. So it'd be like this quarter, these are the blogs I'm going to write. And then that was kind of it. There was no, it was kind of like disassociation between what then DG were working on. So I think like for me, like the important thing is like, like clear line of communication and that the content team are, or the content team on the pod, um, they're, they're predominantly like responsible for like the whole campaign with us in DG. So they're aligned on like the messaging, they're aligned on like the different channels that we use. Um, they can be working on a blog post one day, maybe a video script another day. Um, we're all working together on copy um, for like ads that we're going to put on paid social. So I think like we very much, it's taken a bit of a few weeks to kind of get used to the collaboration, but now it's like we're very much all as like one team. And I think it can be a lot more powerful um, if you can align on and have that focus focus on what you're working on as opposed to everyone working on different things um, I think that's like super important and um, so we'll have like key focuses on one campaign but then we'll have this always on piece where 
content will be well aware what the subject matter expert is working on as well as DG. So for me, like the key learnings have been that constant, like clear line of communication and that we're all one team as opposed to like, um, yeah, all one team as opposed to like working in silos. So how, I just, we just got a mess. Uh, how, do you mind sharing how large your content team is? So we've got um, on the demand gen uh, team, we have two content writers, like content and SEO executives. And then we've got the wider content team responsible for SEO and journalistic content. So how many are we there now? About five or six, four. is it? Four, okay, it's four. So we're six strong um, for content. But I think, as Alice mentioned earlier, it definitely, that definitely wasn't always the way, was it? So we've we've slowly built no, that No, I out. mean, um, yeah, we, we used to have just one content person um, working. And I think it's the same kind of process. So you just can build it out once you start um, proving out the value. And it doesn't need to necessarily always be as well. Like, um, this is where I think people can go wrong in that you have to be a, a content writer to do content. Because when we talk about content, we're talking about everything from like ad copy, landing page copy, to uh, video snippets, uh, to LinkedIn posts, etc. Like some things that really wouldn't necessarily fall in like a traditional content role, um, which is why we felt like there was definitely a position for that to sit more within the demand gen team in this whole create demand world. Um, that's why we think about it that way. And then there's a question here about from Dave, how do you drive content consumers to engage in a sales conversation? So the short answer, um, Dave, is we don't, we don't do this um, out as an outright tactic, if that makes sense. So um, what all we're trying to do in a nutshell with our content is educate people every day in the channels that they want to consume content in, in a meaningful way, um, with the view to the fact that we will be delivering content across all of those four buckets. And so they will be aware of Cognizant. They'll be aware of what we do. Um, they'll also be getting huge value from all of the other more content and thought leadership things that we put out, which have got nothing to do with Cognizant and what we could offer them. And so the belief is that actually when um, B2B contact data becomes an issue, um, we will be top of mind and someone that they will come and evaluate, um, if not be the sole choice for that evaluation. Um, and we just want to make sure that we're consistently um, yeah, continuing to deliver that type of content, quality content that puts us um, front of mind for when that happens. We're not trying to create an artificial funnel, move someone through it um, or assume any form of intent anymore. I think that's kind of the, the old world. Um, there are things that we are looking at, which I think can help maximize the chances of um, creating, getting someone who consumes your content to actually even think about having a sales conversation. And that's just like, like the website journey. So what's that rabbit hole that they go on when they read one con piece of content like what's the journey from that content to further reading whereabouts does that content kind of sit in whether they you know is it a piece of content that has a dotted line into product and what and, th and therefore it might be quite interesting to go to like a comparison page of Cognizant and other b2b data provider tools as a read more item or is that piece of content very top level thought leadership and actually they're probably only interested in learning more about this whole create demand, demand gen world. Um, and we'll try to get better at that. And then how, what those CTAs look like and those on-site website journeys look like as well. Um, and then ultimately we do also do ret run retargeting. So anyone who um, is interacting, and engaging with us, we do have some retargeting plays. So yeah, but it's all aimed to let people come to us rather than us push anything on them. Um, and then have we worked with any agencies or freelancers to support the shift to the media create demand world or have you built this all in-house? So short answer is all in-house, which is why I'd say we are not um, a finished article and there is no playbook for this. Like there isn't like, really um, a shining light example of an organisation who have absolutely nailed it, in my opinion, um, in the B2B world. So we're just um, learning and iterating as we go, as well as that from everything from like what we're actually tracking and how we track it to um, yeah, the types of content, how we build that out. The one that we have actually had a lot of help from Refine Labs, I would say, on um, content buckets. And I think that's been a really useful um, thing for us in terms of structuring and thinking about the content. Um, so previous to that, we didn't really have this thing called content buckets and those four buckets that I spoke about. And that could create a lot of chaos. So give Refine Labs credit for those. Thank you.